Well, welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. I'm here with Mr. Thomas Torme. Hi, how are you? How's it going, Robbie? Thanks for having me on the show. Nice to have you, man. Now, why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself and if you want what you do professionally? Sure, sure. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I'm a uh, 41-year-old uh, father of two from Queens, New York. I'm uh, currently a teacher for the Department of Education. So uh, I've been doing that for about 20 years. Uh, my background is in history. I have an undergraduate in history, master's in history. And uh, I really, really, really like comic books. I've liked comic books since I was a little boy. Um, I always tell people that my, my love affair of comics began when my father used to go out every Sunday, actually every Saturday night to uh, the local uh, <clears throat> newspaper shop and pick up a uh, Sunday paper, the early edition, and some comic books and he would bring them home for me and my brothers. And my older brother uh, was uh, infatuated with comic books, mostly uh, a lot of superhero stuff, a lot of George Perez, but he also liked uh, other stuff, uh, the indies, uh, Lone Wolf and Cub, things that you wouldn't find. Any Archer, the- Archie comics? You know what, Archie comics too, that was a big thing for me. Yeah, sure. I remember the Ninja Turtles. That was a big draw for me. I loved watch uh, <clears throat> not just Archie, but uh, the other, com- uh, other comics they produced. They were great. Love the Ninja Turtles. What was uh, your first comic that you ever got? Uh, on my own or through family? I- I'd say th- through my family. I remember uh, my father, the- in particular, the Archie Ninja Turtle series. That was a big one that he used to bring home for me. But through my brother, uh, I would say Crisis on Infinite Earths. That was a big one that he liked. Did you ever come across any of those Japanese comics? Like a long time ago, um, my grandmom took us to like this store on the beach or something. They were selling these ma- ma- manga, manga, manga I think it's, right? Yeah, yeah. They were selling those books, and not not the stuff with Trump, not manga, like everybody thinks, but like these <laughs> were Japanese comics, and you would open them up, and like I mean, black and white Japanese lettering. You couldn't read anything right. that was going on, and you were just kind of staring at the pictures. I mean, you flip three pages in, next thing you know some dude's getting his head chopped off. You're like, what? did I miss in those yeah. three pages that it qualified to lead to this point? No, I, I'm with you. I, um, manga and anime uh, and on Doctor Who are the few pretty nerdy things I really haven't gotten into um, that I keep swearing to God one day I'm going to get into them. Uh, everyone loves Doctor Who. I have students that have swore by manga and can sing you every anime song they know without knowing a single word. So there's got to be some great value in there that I'm missing. So I want to catch up with those one day. Well, right now, like, well, even if we look at like comic books, history and comic books, they go hand in hand. It might not be actual history, but it's a, a alternative history, a fake history, a comic history, a more of a entertaining type of style. Mm-hmm. But I always sing the sweet praises of these one books that actually taught me a lot about religion. Um, in my middle school, actually intermediate school, there were these books that taught you about the Mayans, taught you about Greek mythology, where I got oh, yeah. my fascination from it. But they were drawn like comic book style. And it was more entertaining for someone like me who didn't want to sit down and read a book um, to be able to read these things and see somebody get their head chopped off and it say like pow up top or something. I'm like, holy shit, like I'm actually learning. Well, I I definitely think uh, those two mediums do belong together. I mean, uh, comic books are an American mythology. You know, now it's global. But when it began here in the 30s, uh, you know, with the pulp and then moving into superhero stuff in the late 30s into the 40s, very uniquely American mythology. So it is cool that you see uh, children learning about Hercules and Greek mythology through comic books themselves. Uh, American comics have been published continuously for over 80 years. They're drawing on something, you know, the 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 artists, the writers, they're drawing from their knowledge of mythology, their, the, what's going on in the news, and they're using all that information to create the comics. So I, so I agree with you that it is kind of a warped version of history, you know, um, uh, more of ideal in most cases than we would like it to be but it is a great place to draw from and that's actually that was the nature of my uh my history thesis comic uh, excuse me my history thesis from my master's degree i wrote about how superman comic books can be uh, uh primary sources in the classroom so if you look back at superman from the 1930s uh into the early 40s he is a social crusader you know he's smashing slums he's stopping wife beaters he is stopping corrupt senators and he's doing this all outside the law the law is hunting him he's a vigilante you know by the 1940s and world war ii 
we are looking at Superman as a uh, kind of a, just an extension of FDR's New Deal policies. He is uh, the ultimate kind of uh, American in this situation. And then, then that continuously evolves through the 50s, 70s. Uh, his role changes as our status in the country, uh, in the world changes too. He's the reason I can never look at a telephone booth. And, you know, I always see someone walk in there. I'm like, he's about to, two yeah. second change right there. Trust me. I know it's going right. to happen. He's going to, he's going to take off the glass. It's kind of weird that no one noticed that he was just wearing glasses the whole time. I feel like somebody would have pointed out, like I've seen all no. these photos of people catching celebrities when they're up in disguises or wearing right. something. I'm like, you're telling me you can't catch Superman just because he doesn't have his uh, glasses or something like that's a little bit well, ridiculous. They, they did ask Noelle Neal about that. The actress who played Lois Lane in the, uh, in the serials and then again with the George Reeves series. Uh, and she said, well, if I told everyone he was Superman, I'd be out of a job. So she, she knew, she pretended like she knew it was, uh, she didn't know, but she really did just so she could keep her job. Who's your favorite out of the Marvel universe? Uh, out of the Marvel universe, I'll go with Spider-Man. I've always liked Spider-Man. Really? Okay. Oh yeah. You know, just uh, this kind of wiry teenager trying to find his place in the world while at the same time endowed with these incredible powers. What do you uh, think of uh, Tom Holland playing Spider-Man? Oh, he's, I think he's great. Um, the, the, I tell you, the only Spider-Man, and I always get a lot of hate for this, the only Spider-Man that I really didn't like is Andrew Garfield. and, and nothing. Why would you get heat for that? He was the worst <laughs> Spider-Man of all time. I get I, I it. I think he my was... reasoning for why I don't like Andrew Garfield. He's a great actor. I think, what was it, Hacksaw Ridge that I saw him in? He was really, really good. But... I just thought he was way too cool to be Spider-Man. Uh, I, I, I see it. I see it. I think you know? um, he had, like, obviously he was playing the nerd, kind of like Peter Parker, but he just had, like, the look about him where it was like, I don't actually believe you ride a scooter. I believe you probably have a Mustang parked in the parking lot. Yeah, yeah. You know what? He, uh, and I, I think it was the first Amazing Spider-Man. He pulls up on a skateboard. He, uh, he's not being bullied by Flash Thompson. He stands up to Flash Thompson, who's bullying someone else. And then he gets the, uh, uh, in their universe, the best looking girl uh, in the, you know, he, he, despite all his stammering, he stammered through the entire movie. I, 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 I'm, I'm Spider-Man, you know? Yeah. And, and uh, he ended up getting the best looking girl. I don't know. It it's hard. Cool. It's, I like it's, my Spider-Man nerdy. Tom Holland makes sense because he's an actual like age representation. I just don't like yeah. him because people say I look like him. And oh, if for people, that, for people that are uh, looking at video, you can tell right here, but hold on zooms in mm, yeah yeah oh totally well uh, yeah. I, yeah i don't like that but um no uh tom people, Holland's people tell me i look like uh wolverine if he had every superpower except for uh enhanced metabolism enhanced <laughs> that's funny mm -hmm. i had i used when i was a kid i used to get uh my uh hair used to get wet and it used to curl up on the sides to make the wolverine kind of fro that's nice. my all-time favorite right there if you're gonna say a superhero I, I know he's a mutant technically an x-men but he's probably he's yeah he's probably my all-time favorite i know everybody nowadays just with the uh types of things going on with movies and all it's all deadpool everything because just because he breaks the wall so much he's a little bit more of a, a right. if you're gonna classify anybody as like maybe a superhero he's kind of one he just makes a lot of representations that are kind of new to what we're looking at now but Wolverine, oh, yeah. the original mo the movie that I had with him with his brother where they're fighting through the war and they're like it shows like the years and years that they've been together mm -hmm. i'm like they should make a spinoff no no i agree brother. like his brother should have his own movie uh so yeah that that's that was a great scene where they showed him going through uh i think it was the civil war possibly or maybe uh world war one definitely uh World War II. I mean, that was that was great. That that, that itself could have been. What was that? Um, origins. Yeah, origins. Yeah, uh, that that itself could have been a dumb movie. Uh, I, I would look forward to seeing something like that. You notice that people give a lot more flack to the movies that don't really follow the storylines of each like of each predecessor. I would say, like comic books. Like, I mean, I watched. I think one of my very first comic books was the Kiss comic book. But when I actually started to buy my own. Um, the I kiss, ended, as in the rock band kiss yeah my dad was a huge kiss fanatic he's like yeah, you ever yeah. seen this and then it was kiss meets the phantom of the park and they had like the actual powers like their names were right, so i right. was like holy shit this is yeah, awesome yeah, they, they, they're very good at marketing yeah Gene simmons and paul stanley very good at marketing and um when i first actually got my own comics was like it was the x-men uh 
kills or it was Deadpool kills the Marvel universe or something. Right. And then I, I bought one that was like Wolverine killing the incredible Hulk or the incredible Hulk mm -hmm. killing Wolverine by ripping all the adamantium off his bones and stuff like that. And I'm like the movies, like nobody gets upset at the comic books for not following. Cause it's like their own little parallel universes. They're all little bits and stories through like yeah. uh, different alternate timelines and stuff. But I, when I was a kid, they used to use the term uh, imaginary stories as if the entire thing wasn't an imaginary story. Uh, well, you, well, you got to think you have so many artists creating the, basically the same uh, I guess a different idea but like the same kind of meaning in each comic book and it's like I don't want to if if Hal Jordan or whatever flies a jet into a building and then he's paralyzed then you can't use the rest of Green Lantern so I can't have that happen you know what I mean right. so you have to go and do your own thing which that's good for comic books not good for movies because now everybody's like there was this how did they leave off this how do they explain that how do they explain right. this it's like it's fucking movies man people are gonna have their own directing take on it people crapped on the green lantern he's my all-time favorite superhero out of all he's time a good one. even though uh ryan reynolds even craps on his own character it doesn't matter because that's the only green lantern movie that we have so it's like yeah. that gave me a connection to that. Just like, hey, even if it, you know, they could have did stuff better, I still got to like it. Well, I, I, it's the same logic with uh, movies about historical events. I mean, the movies are designed to entertain you. They're not really designed to educate you. Uh, whereas the DC comics have been published since 1938. A lot of these characters have been around since the 40s. Uh, I, I don't know. I think some people are expecting all of that mythology to be jammed into a two hour film. And then they come out disappointed knowing that uh, hopefully in their hearts that that's just not possible. You can't put all that in there. It's too much for an audience who doesn't know Green Lantern. You, you may be familiar with Green Lantern. You, you have knowledge of him going into the movie. I, I pro probably 50% of the people who were sitting in the theater had no idea who Green Lantern is probably just went because Ryan Reynolds and it looked colorful and it was a fun movie. I think people are expecting too much. Then they end up uh, uh, crapping all over these movies that really have a lot of potential. They're, they're all pretty good. I mean, look what they're doing to the Star Wars movies. You know, the fans are tearing it apart, but at the end of the day, it's, it's good entertainment. It's fun. It's funny you said like it's a good introduction or it's like a, you know, for someone that already knows the movies, it's good to see something like that. Like I enjoyed the Green Lantern and somebody wouldn't that it was their first time because my buddy took his girlfriend and she's never seen any type of superhero movie to go see Endgame. And I was like, she's going to be fucking clueless. Yeah, yeah. She's That's gonna a be, tough one to be a first time. Not only clueless on what's going on, but also like it's a three and a half hour movie of straight, you know, no That's like trying to see the ending of Twilight and without seeing any of the predecessors before that. You're just sitting there like, right. I don't know what the hell is going on. Everybody's making out one minute then trying to kill each other the next. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Why is that? Dra why is Dracula sparkling? Yeah. Why is that vampire sparkling? But uh with 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 Endgame, you need you needed what twenty one other real films to understand what the heck was going on. Uh, that's a lot. That's I just a had, lot. I just tried to picture myself in that theater and her just being like, "What are those stones?" I'm like, oh, "Are you shitting me?" <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. And meanwhile, the rest of the theater is looking at her and he, he's trying to calm everybody down. It's fine. It's fine. Points at Iron Man. So that's the Incredible Hulk. When does he <laughs> yeah, go yeah. green? It's like uh, holy shit! You could have picked any other movie. Steve Carell Date Night was probably on. You could have watched that. That was much better for them. I, I, it's amazing that that is now the number one uh, a draw. I don't know if it's not just. Uh, I don't know if it's in the United States only or uh, internationally. But who, who would have guessed that Endgame would be the biggest movie of all time? Ah, uh, dude. I. You know what's weird is that thirty years ago I would have never have guessed it, but now I'm right. starting. Like, Same I here. bet you probably wish you were born now because you could be so involved with this culture. I mean, I've talked to so many people that own their own comic book stores that mm -hmm. were all into this stuff, and they're like, "What the fuck? Like, I can't believe that this is now becoming the big social trend. Everybody's loving Batman. Everybody's loving Spider Man. Everybody's right, wearing. Right. Everybody wears a superhero T-shirt nowadays. It become like this giant hit. I have no idea where that happened. Do you think that's because yeah. Disney took it? over uh that's a good question it, it is pretty cool to be alive at a time where comics have gone from the subculture to mainstream uh where my you know my my mother who's in her 70s knows who iron man is now you know and prior to these movies wouldn't have a clue uh I, i'm guessing a lot of people are in that as well that same boat uh yeah, I, I do blame, I do give a lot of the credit, I don't say blame, but I do give a lot of the credit to Disney. They did a remarkable job creating this universe that just had been, you know, I, I was just trying to show my son uh, the Swamp Thing movies uh, 
from the 80s, uh, Return of the Swamp Thing. I think it came out in 89 with Heather Locklear, and it's just almost uh, unwatchable. You know, I, I, I loved it as a kid. I thought it was great. Uh, but by today's standards, I mean, the pacing and the action and the special effects, that's, that's what we were getting as comic book fans. You know, we were getting the Roger Corman Fantastic Four, although, you know, uh, I, I would only be able to see the Roger Corman Fantastic Four movie in uh, uh, conventions, these small, and when I say conventions, I mean conventions that were in like church basements, you know? You're talking about the new Fantastic Four one that came out. Well, uh, in the early 90s, I forget what year off the top of my head, um, in order for Fox to hold on to the rights, I think it was Fox, in order for, uh, in order for Roger Corman, let's say, to even hold on to the rights to Fantastic Four, he had to do something with it. So he filmed this entire Fantastic Four movie uh, secretly knowing that it was never going to be distributed. He never told the actors or anyone on the crew that it was never going to be distributed. And uh, it is, uh, I think you watch the entire film on YouTube. Uh, it, that, that, that was the standard. You know, we, we were dealing with uh, Captain America... Um, from the eighties, I think he was played by, um, oh gosh, he's the grandson of a famous author. I can't think of his name off the top of my head. Uh, but he was wearing a Captain America mask where the ears chafed him. Yeah. So they put the fake ears on over it and they just looked like Wings. curly fries. You know, they yeah. didn't look like real human ears. It was just, uh, those are the movies we were getting until Batman came out. Bat Batman changed everything. Michael Keaton's Batman uh, in 89, that, that did a lot, but it didn't, still didn't, Bring about, it to where it is today. I about to say my Batman is Christian Bale just because of the age kind of difference a little bit. Right. I didn't grow up on a Michael Keaton, but I remember like, and I'll ask you one of like your best, I guess, movie uh, comic book moments. I remember sitting in the theater when Dark Knight came out. And I mean, I'm young, 13 years old, like probably, you know, just able, I guess, the age to really watch something like that. Freaking, and, and enjoy it, right? And yeah. And resonate with you. And you, yeah, yeah, man. Yeah. yeah and I, I get what you're saying. I was with my dad and it was the beginning scene where they're robbing the bank and then the Joker shoots the gun. No, I killed the bus driver. And then <laughs> right. he pulls out a gun oh, and shoots him. Too. My dad's like, holy shit. I'm like, that's 25 cents in the swear jar. He's like, here's 20 bucks should get me through the rest of the film. Uh, yeah. And like, that was his thing. He loved that movie i mean we me and him used to go see superhero movies all the time uh when i was a kid especially like you know green lancer and any of these types of movies because that was something we could connect over and i always remember specifically um which you probably have a memory like this too after the movie i would go to 7-eleven and get the collector edition slurpee cups with oh, the sure. straw we do we did it after incredible hulk i mean that was our thing we'd pump up he goes how were your grades how was your grades in school for the week i'm like D's, F's, I mean, what else do you want? He's like, dude, I already got tickets. I'm like, well, we're going anyway. So then right. you just went, and then next thing you know, you're having this amazing bonding experience with your family, which I, what I think these movies are all about. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, um, my, my, I, absolutely, and that's, that's great that you share memories like that. And uh, I'm hoping to, I have two sons, uh, one's 12 and one's nine. I'm hoping to build memories like that with them as well. Uh, even, you know, they have their own personalities, their own passions, but uh, I definitely try to share my passion for uh, – comics and just pop culture with them but i i definitely say my favorite uh you know there's so many cool ones of sitting in the theater and watching uh crowds react to certain scenes but i i remember sitting watching the michael keaton 1989 uh when they sh first show the batmobile and uh, she says something along the lines of let's take my car and he says no let's take mine and they show the Batmobile and the theater just erupted in applause and cheers. And that, that was just so cool. Uh, I, I'll definitely remember that for the rest of my life. That was a great reaction. I think a lot of the older ones, uh, you know, the older Batman movies, they definitely had a lot more character put into it. It seemed like it relied a little bit more on the acting rather than the special effects. It seems like yeah, I, I don't think they had much of a choice in a lot of areas. Uh, okay. this, uh, if they tried to pull off some of the special effects, I mean, Avengers is, uh, you know, Endgame is what well, it's got to be. I, I can't imagine a single frame that didn't have a special effect shot in it. Do you think that it's the acting, which is why it's so popular now? Or do you think a lot of it is just due to the special effects? Because I look at a lot of these actors and try and sell, like, obviously, Robert Downey Jr. is Iron Man, okay? Nobody's going to recast that role at all. It took me forever. Yeah, I hope they don't. Yeah, it took me forever to get Chris Evans as Captain America. I was still thinking of him as like, oh, it's the human torch, you know what right, I mean? Right, right. It's difficult in that matter. I definitely think the acting pulled it off. I, I, I don't think Avengers 
uh, could have been the, the entire Marvel uh, cinematic universe couldn't have been what it was if it wasn't for these amazing actors, Chris Evans, Robert Downey Jr. I mean, just, and I could keep going, you know, they, they're, they, I mean, they're, they're headliners in their own right uh, in every single film they're in. And now they don't have to be, now they could just take the small indie roles that they want because they're all mo most likely multimillionaires. I know Robert Downey Jr. is, but, um, you know, it, it, it's a comedy, like, uh, I think Doolittle is a good example of that where Doolittle had um, Robert Downey Jr. had uh, tons of special effects. I can't imagine what it cost the studio, uh, but a weak storyline and people, it didn't resonate with people and no one, you know, and, and it flopped. Uh, you, you gotta have all three. You gotta have that great story, great special effects. If you're counting on the special effects to carry the movie, then you're not gonna have repeat business. You know, you're not gonna have people I, I can still watch any of the uh, Marvel Universe movies and enjoy it. And not really once do I say, oh, you know, great special effect. You know, I'm not really watching for that. I think another good one that came out that really sparked a huge interest in this, like Marvel or uh, these type of comic book movies in general is Guardians of the Galaxy. I mean, oh, yeah. We talk about like kids my age, millennials, whatever, you know, with these whatever you want to say hipster type vibes or something. They're very, very keen on trying to bring back old things like records, mm -hmm. uh, comic books. They want physical copies of things now. And I think that's because for so long we've been buying digital um, that things are just like, oh, it's cool. I have it downloaded on my app store, but then I don't know my password. So now I don't have it. So now we're looking back and trying to find these things. I mean, I take trips to, uh, what do you call it? Thrift stores just to get um, records and put them up on my wall because I like the art and the style to them. I mean, I got a Bill Cosby first stand up record before I knew what happened. And, <laughs> right. you know, it's, it's, it's amazing to look at too, but then you look at with the social trend of things. I mean, Guardians of the Galaxy brought back old music. I'm a big oh, fan yeah. of uh, Fallout Four. It's uh, you know, any of the Fallout series games takes uh, takes place in like an apocalyptic wasteland. But you turn on the radio in that game, it's Frank Sinatra, it's Ink Spots, it's mm -hmm. all these old classic stuff. Where I'm like, where the hell was this music? Like, I don't like this stuff now. Let me go back to this old style thing. You know, Fly Me to the Moon. That is becoming popular with so many kids nowadays because now they're like, holy crap, there's this thing that was in our past that we need to bring back to the present because it's, it's just making a trend again. I, I, I agree. I, I, my 12-year-old my, my walks around singing Mr. Blue Sky. He loves it. Um, and it's, it's, that's probably the uh, – I can't think of any other superhero movie that has resonated with a soundtrack uh, – like Guardians did with its soundtrack since, and uh, not to reference it yet again, but when Batman came out and the Prince album, uh, Prince soundtrack went along with it. I, I, he had so many songs on the soundtrack and they were all uh, playing on the radio, you know? I mean, and again, by today's standards, wouldn't float, but it's a, it's a different situation where Prince made those songs for Batman, whereas James Gunn picked these songs because he thought it would reflect uh, the tone and feel of Guardians. Guardians is such such a such a great movie. You know who I think predicted this trend kind of in a way? I think it was Six Flags because I remember a lot of times when I was mm -hmm. a kid going to Six Flags, they had the Batmobile in the middle of the park. Yeah, they yeah. Had all like the everything was Batman, Spider Man, all these superhero type things, and now it seems like the world is capitalizing on that a little bit. You know, I, the children that grow up with it want it in some way when they're an adult as well. You know, uh, Barack Obama brought a copy of Spider Man into the White House with him when he went. You know. So people who enjoy these things as children definitely want to continue to enjoy them as adults. Maybe not in the same capacity. You know, you might not want to go to the roller coaster as much as you did to see the Batman. But you might want to see it on the screen. You might want to have a replica in your home. Uh, you know, these these are the things. These these comic books. So people discredit them, but uh, and the comic book characters. But they they help define uh, who we become as adults in the same way that uh, school does. In the same way that religion does these do you, they they have they're very impactful do you have any collectible type things besides comic books that you had when you were a kid like for me um i still have like some of the old bottles they were called belly washers which looked like that batman statue you have in the back but like it was the top half of the cap was a superhero so you would get like oh, the, the thing yes. those little uh, juice boxes for kids basically uh, I, i'm familiar with those i still see some of those now right uh but, uh, you know, I, I wasn't, um, as, a, as a kid, I wasn't really a collector of uh, cards, a lot of cards. Uh, 
uh, the superhero cards, the X-Men cards, DC Universe. Uh, I still have my Superman cards uh, upstairs. Uh, uh, I was addicted. Jeez. Uh, we, we, my brother and I still talk about the Ninja Turtle Christmas. I was such a uh, cartoon fan, loved, loved the Ninja Turtles. Uh, but I, I, I wish I still had that stuff. I don't. Uh, I, live in an, I live in Queens, New York, and we were one of those places that were uh, hit by Hurricane Sandy. So we, we, anything that was in my house, uh, uh, I wasn't here at the time, but my parents were, and uh, they, uh, anything that was here was gone. I know my, my brother had a large comic collection, and that all got washed away. So I, I, I actually have gone the other route, where, uh, and you were describing people uh, wanting to go back to having that, uh, the comic in their hand, the record. Uh, on the wall and uh, I've actually gone the other route where I had all that and I lost it and I don't want to experience that again so I try not to have uh, too many physical things I actually go uh, the digital route with a lot of things uh, you know uh, I remember I was so prideful of my VHS then DVD collection and now it's just become uh, you know getting the codes and, and putting them on a streaming service like Voodoo uh, so that's why I can take it with me anywhere and not have to worry about losing it. This, this behind me is uh, more of my uh, zombie books, history books. Um, some, some of the books you're seeing are, are the history of comic books, but I don't collect as much as I used to. I rely on a lot of uh, uh, apps like the DCU app to catch up with my comic books. That's a good thing to get kids like my age into it as well as they have an app on your phone that lets you have every single like Marvel comic or something yeah. on it. I mean, I'm still I was struggling with how to read it. You press yeah, yeah, a button, yeah. and then it zooms in, zooms out. I'm still struggling with that concept, but I'm getting it. Yeah, I'm telling you, at like one o'clock in the morning, I'm like looking at one of these things. I'm like, I feel like reading a Green Lantern comic, and they have every single one that you, oh, that yeah. has been like created that you wouldn't even think of. I mean, I still like. I wish I kind of had the physical copy. I get it's a space type thing, but it's just having that feel of that paper in your hand too. Like, I mean, I've heard talk to so many people that have different meanings with comic books, and one that really stood out was like one I'm interested in weightlifting and uh, working out all the time and uh, my bodybuilding manager that his name's chuck he was on my fifth episode and he was telling me why he loved comic books and superheroes so much because you would see all the weightlifters wear like captain america jackets or superman jackets or something you're like all right i get it you want to be a superhero that's literally what it was he goes i wanted to become a bodybuilder because i was drawing these superheroes out on like a piece of paper and i was like i want a body like this i want muscles like this i want to represent what a superhero phys physical features represent and he started getting in super into weightlifting and won competitions and stuff and i'm like it's crazy yeah, to Amazing. see how people take this giant thing that is literally a part of our society i would say i mean this sure. is a giant structure for a lot of people bringing back memories bringing back certain um things and wanting them to instill things into their kids also a formative part in a person's character i, I agree with you 100 percent, and and it's great that uh you you yourself and you know people that can look at a captain america type character and say you know what that's how i want to be i want to have that look that feel uh, whereas someone else might look at an Iron Man and say, well, you know, Iron Man never really made it where he is because of his physical ability, but more of his mental ability. And they may take that aspect of his character and roll with that to help them define who they are. And that's why there's so many, that's why it's so important that there are so many varied personalities, varied characters that children, uh, young adults can look at and say, okay, this is how I see myself. When I pose like Superman, I want to feel like him. I want to act like him. And uh, these, these, it's good. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, I'll stop on that. If I, if I had to choose, or if I had to ask you, what superhero would you want to be? Which one would it be? Uh, I'll go with, I physically look like the blob, but I will go with, um, I'll go with a, a Green Lantern. Green because, Lantern? Uh, it, it, it's a matter of will, you know? Uh, it is a matter of will, wanting to, you know, just creating something in your mind and then uh, making it happen. And that's such a, a difficult skill for me to master and, and a lot of people where we all have these great ideas. I'm, I'm sure at one point you had an idea to create a podcast and here it is hundreds of episodes later, you know, you, you're doing it, you're doing it. You're living out your expectation. You're living out your dream. That's not everybody. You know, I'm, not everybody has that ability to, to manifest I'm, it. I'm like Tom Brady, though. I'm still missing that ring, if you know what I mean. 
Yeah, well, you, you know what? You're doing a great job. I, 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 like I said to you the other day, I watched a lot of the episodes. You're very well put together, very well done. Um, and this is it. This, this is a great thing that you're doing. And uh, other people don't have that. They, they, there's a disconnect between wanting it and then uh, it happening. So I, I think as a Green Lantern, it would maybe help me uh, to bridge that gap between wanting it and seeing it. Do you think it's a little bit difficult just like when people bring up the point like, oh, he's nothing without his ring. Same thing with Batman. He's nothing without his tool belt. I'm like, but he makes those things work. If I gave you that ring, if I gave you that tool belt, you wouldn't be able to do the things he could do. Right. Uh, um, if, if people think that they're nothing without their powers, then they really don't understand the character themselves. Uh, they, they, they are aware of the character on a superficial level. They, that character is a toy to them. Uh, but for those people who have read the books and uh, whether it's a novel, a graphic novel, just any random issue, uh, you know that it's more of the heart and soul of the character that make them who they are. Uh, there was this great scene in one of the Justice League animated movies. I think it was Justice League War where he's talking to uh, Batman is Bruce. Yeah. Batman is talking to Green Lantern. And uh, as they're talking, and Green Lantern is essentially exposing how the ring works. Batman subtly slips the ring off his finger because he had distracted him. Uh, and the, the ring only works with concentration. He had distracted him and was able to take the ring right off and didn't use a single gadget from his utility belt or it didn't cost him a dime from his billions of dollars. You know? Yeah. I think if I had to pick a superhero, I would really say Green Lantern, but honestly, Benedict, Benedict Cumberbatch does a very good job as playing Doctor Strange. I just know if I had Doctor Strange's abilities, I would end up probably locking myself in my mind on accident. Just <laughs> too much of that stuff, the shadow realm, all this other types of things. He starts doing a little spinny thing with his hands, teleports. It. I'm like, that's so much awesome power, but I'm like, there's, I would slip and end up in like a dimension far, far away where I could not get out. That, that, is, that is pretty cool to do the dimension hopping. I would like to see uh, other planes of existence. That would be pretty cool. That's a good choice of character. Now, he mastered it pretty quickly, didn't he? In the, in the movie, he yeah. mastered his, uh, his sling ring and all those powers. He was supposed to be the best. And I was like, is it the, the gem, the, the power stone that's giving him this power right now? Or is it the fact that he just kept reading and reading and reading? Like it shows him reading, yeah. obviously, books and books and books. But I'm like, still, how do you soak up that much information? Are they, you they did kind of... They did kind of chalk it up to a photographic memory, which that's a good power. I don't know if it was a superpower or not, but it, they, um, yeah, he, 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 right. He, he read a lot. That was his superpower. He read a lot and he remembered a lot. Super reading seems like the <laughs> off brand superpower of most superpowers. Yeah. If you could choose to be a super villain, who would you want to be? Ah, uh, super villain. That's a good question. Um, depending on my mood, doomsday, just rampaging, but I'll say for longevity, uh, I'll go with a Lex Luthor type, you know, kind of uh, his, again, going back to the idea that his, his real power is being a uh, 12th level intellect, you know, versus uh, Doomsday, who's just a rampaging beast. Or uh, I'll go with the intellect as he's, a, as a he's more like player. an opposite of Bruce Wayne. Basically he's got the money. He's got the smarts. He yeah. just has this hatred for uh, Superman. I, I love villains. I, I, drive my son crazy with this stuff all the time. I love villains that are um, not the opposite of the hero. Uh, I don't know how to explain that any other way. Uh, I'm sure there are much better terms for this, but you know, Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader have the same skill set. Uh, if you watch a lot of the Marvel movies, and this is where I, I some of them drive me a little crazy where uh, Ant-Man had Yellow Jacket, Iron Man had Iron Monger, um, Black Panther was phenomenal, I thought, until Killmonger put the suit on at the end and just became uh, another guy in a suit. And, you know, I, I like it when they don't have the same skill set. So Superman and Lex Luthor are completely different. Yeah. But yet he's the arch nemesis, you know? I look at um, movies like. I mean, I don't know if Doctor Strange honestly has a super villain. I think besides, like, um, what's that one thing he fights at the ending? Uh, Dormammu. Yeah, Dormammu. But I mean, that's like, it, I wouldn't even call that his arch nemesis or something. I would just call that an evil force that he had to stop. Much like the Green Lantern had to fight that monster that was coming up to go, you know, mess up his oh, whole entire Oh, Parallax monster, yeah. Yeah. So I look yeah. at, 
I look at like a, a movie, you know, Venom is probably one of the supervillains I'd want to be mm. just because I just that suit. I mean, obviously, if we saw the Venom movie was completely yeah. different representation and did Venom so much better than um, uh, the one with Spider-Man where he was in. I mean, that kind of did him a little it? bit. Dirty. Topher, Topher Grace, is that his name? The actor? Uh, yeah. The guy from that 70s show? Yeah, the guy that played Eddie Brock. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Tom Holland, uh, not Tom Holland. Sorry, I'm talking to Tom Holland. Um, uh, what's the uh, cheats? Tom Hardy. Tom <laughs> Hardy did such a great, great job with uh, Venom. You know, one I of think- the things someone pointed out online is that uh, he has this gray sweatshirt on, just dripping with uh, sweat and God knows what else. And someone fully expected at one point for him to take his shirt off and have that normal kind of what they call it a beefcake scene where you know you had. You had like Chris Evans flexing and all that stuff, and he never takes it off. He just stays with that gray, uh, sweaty sweatshirt the entire time. And so that was uh, going against that kind of superhero expectation of what you were. Well, Venom kind of shows the expectations of like what you would be like if you were drunk, like when he was first experiencing the <laughs> symptoms of like, you know, he would open up his fridge and grab like a bunch of raw food, like raw steak, and just start eating it. I'm like, that's what you do when you're so hammered, you don't know what you're doing. Absolutely. Yeah. I've been down that road too many times. <laughs> well, I think it's uh, interesting too, because like if I saw this meme, um, it was with the Winter Soldier. So it was a picture of, I don't know if you've ever seen uh, Joe Rogan and his dog, but then he's got a werewolf in his um, uh, studio. He's got like a giant, like fake werewolf statue, this giant gnarly beast. And he had his dog right beside it. And it says on the left was the giant werewolf. And it said, the Winter Soldier before he joined the Avengers, and then like the next one was the Golden Retriever. It was like then after the uh, the joining the Avengers, I'm like, he totally dumbed down, man. He was That's this true. giant badass, like you know, tearing up everybody. And then in the movie, like he's like, yeah, he's killing people with guns, but eventually he's just like getting you know t- attacked all the time, getting beaten down. I'm like, did they just not want to give him any good parts. I I feel a lot of those moves were done because. Uh... Uh, probably two reasons. One, I, I think Marvel has guys. I'm, I'm sorry. Who is the Winter Soldier? His name. Uh, uh, can, Bucky. Can, I'm sorry? Bucky. Oh, no, I meant the, the actor. I can't think of his name. Uh, oh, I don't know that one. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, boy, I, I know it. it just uh, anyway. This just proves our point. Nobody cares. <laughs> but, you know, they, they have actors like him under like nine year, excuse me, nine film contracts. I think they have plans to kind of, especially with the new uh, Falcon and Winter Soldier TV show. They're going to do things with that character. But I get, I get what you're saying that he, he and, and went to soldier, Captain America went to soldier. He was this uh, amazing threat. And then by uh, infinity war, he was uh, just shooting his gun in a circle. Uh, all those skills disappeared. Uh, but you know, the one thing I wanted to tell you, uh, uh, you had mentioned guardians before and um, Guardians was such a great movie because I, I don't know about you, but I, even as a comic book fan, I had really zero knowledge of Guardians going into the movie. Um, I knew they existed in the comic universe. I, I, I don't think I've ever picked up a Guardians book before the movie came out. Uh, so I, I'm sure that gave Marvel a lot of uh, leeway with the characters. You know, you change one thing about Superman, Batman, Hulk, or people will react. They know the mythology of these characters enough. I don't think people knew enough about Guardians to even say much about it. Um, I only knew it that Chris Pratt was in it. That's the reason why I watched it. Oh, is that true? Yeah. Yeah, I I wasn't too familiar with Chris Pratt prior to that. Uh, I know he was on uh, Parks and Rec, but I I didn't really uh, watch the show. I, I saw clips of it, but I never really watched it. I don't think with those types of movies that, well, with those types of movies, it's the opening scene that gets you. I mean, same thing with Batman, that opening scene, but you saw Chris Pratt singing and, you know, listening to like, you know, come and get your love or something like throughout the movie, like those scenes captured the audience immediately. And I think that's important because so many times you see a superhero movie where it's just like, what's, what's, what, when's the action going to kick up? When am Mm -hmm. I trying to see this happen? Like, I'm just hearing a very long drawn out story right now. So, the, yeah, I agree with you. And, and pr- even prior to that, I was crying in the first five minutes when Peter wouldn't hold his dying mother's hand. I mean, and I had no idea about these characters at all. And they, they got me in the first five minutes. And then you follow it up with things like this. And, and then they hit you with the music right away. Uh, and you're in. Great. I, mean, I, I think uh, that might have been a really bad death scene in any movie. But I think the worst one that we can all agree on is in Spider-Man when the Uncle Ben gets shot. Oh, from the uh, the Tobey Maguire ones. 
I don't think I've ever cried that hard in my entire life. And I've seen the Titanic multiple times, but (laughs) that was like, holy shit. They, they, they still have not mentioned uh, uncle Ben in the new Spider-Man movies at all. Yeah, he's uh, they, dead though. That's, yeah, they they they've mentioned a death. They 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 haven't said him by name. They the closest thing they came to it is I think on a suitcase that he's when he's packing to go to Europe. It says uh, uh, B uh, B P on it. I think uh, so, in, implying Ben Parker. But um, they they still haven't mentioned, and they still I don't believe they've said uh, with great power comes great responsibility either. They haven't mentioned that yet. So hopefully they will in the third movie. Yeah, I'm trying to look for um, – if you look at, uh, like, the Spider-Man movies, like, everyone always talks trash on Spider-Man 3, but I honestly couldn't find anything super wrong with it. I definitely think it was rushed, just adding Sandman and then Venom and then all these into one movie. But yeah. I think they went really, really well together, especially when you find out that the Sandman killed Ben Parker's – like, you know, killed Ben Parker, Peter Parker's uncle. So I was right. like – I had no idea about that. So when that scene came up, I was like – Whoa, like I remember seeing the first Spider Man, like, wow, he just got shot and then they he got the guy. No, he didn't get the guy. The actual guy got away. They 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 they, they had a good actor for that. I, 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 his name escapes me too, the guy who played Sam and he was on a show called Wings, I think, and then He used uh, to play in George of the Jungle. He, he did? Yeah, he was the bad guy in George of the Jungle. Oh, he's a bad guy, okay. Uh yeah, he was he's a good actor. Uh they, he did a good job. Uh, I couldn't care less about Sam and Pride to that movie. Uh, they it's uh, they gave him the uh, I call it the Mister Freeze treatment, where yeah. you, got, you you give him that kind of tragic background to a character that really is almost laughable. You know, Mister Freeze has a freeze gun, and Sandman can turn into sand. And but you give him a motivation, you give him a background, and, and you, you can turn that character around. I think they did a good job with Sandman in well, Spider Man Three. What are your thoughts on the show Gotham? I like, I'm starting to like that show. Like I, I watched it when it first came out and then like now they got the new seasons, but like, it seems like the characters are really, really fit for their roles. Like it, the actors. I mean, Where are of, you on the show? You're early in the show. I'm way at the end now. Oh, okay. Well, I, I, I thought it had great potential to be a, a show about the Gotham city, the police department. Yeah. Um, and it, 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 it obviously went, uh, uh, I think it, was on for five seasons possibly uh uh in the later seasons it, it went uh off the deep end in terms of its supernatural elements and uh solomon grundy was a little bit like okay the radioactive waste i get that but it was a lot it was very yeah. hard for people to fall into that when people kept dying and being brought back i'm like okay right. and now we're at this certain point where it's like they got the scarecrow. They got everybody involved. They got the penguin. You've seen the whole transformation from him from being yeah. this low life to being this giant mobster now, which is pretty interesting. Right. But, I think they did a good job with the penguin on the show. You know. Yeah, Mr. Cobblepot. That was a good one too. I mean, yeah. they can't beat Danny DeVito, but still, oh, I mean, he, my, that guy did a great job doing that one. Still one of my favorite uh, superhero movies, Batman Returns, and I think Batman's in the movie for about. 12 minutes he's not even in it that long it's more about the villains in that movie yeah which was well i I think if we look at like gotham and stuff too like there's i think that tells a lot about the story between bruce wayne and also uh Mm -hmm. uh, no chief gordon i think there's a there's a lot that isn't explained into the movies on to why they have this deep connection and why he's keeping his secret for so long understanding that he is a protector that is needed but also like when two-face is involved that was i didn't see any of that coming i'm surprised the coin flip didn't even get me interested or didn't even give me a hint of two-face being brought in but um, i don't i don't think they uh, from what i remember i I don't feel like they didn't really use two-face as much as they could have uh, which is a shame because, you know, uh, they, they had Harvey Dent on the show, but I don't remember him being used as much. They had a lot of characters like that, I feel, that weren't uh, used to their full potential. In the well, first season, they had uh, Renee Montoya on the show for like an episode or two, and that's it. They never, ever brought them back. Yeah, I think, um, you know, like in Gotham, uh, they have, I think it's everything's supposed to come down later down the road, but then eventually it's probably not going to make it another season or another one after that. It seems like it's getting a little bit old just because you can only keep rehashing the same comic book crap over and over and over again when people have already seen the movies and the movies do it so much better. Like in The Dark Knight, it's finding out that he was two-faced, that whole thing. They they really had too many supervillains, I think, in that movie total, just mm-hmm. with the Joker and then Two-Face. Like, I feel like they stayed a little bit too close to 
and Two Face. They should have just made it into a sequel movie or maybe something that would follow afterwards that talked about the death of Harvey Dent and all these types of things because the Joker was such an impactful role. Once you bring up the Dark Knight, it's either you're bringing up Christian Bale or you're bringing up uh, Heath Ledger. Yeah, that, that, I think uh, I, I don't envy anyone who had to be a part of making the Dark Knight Rises because they had to follow up on the success and then, uh, you know, untimely death of Heath Ledger who killed it as the Joker. It was just amazing. And then they had to, they had to make their own movie after that uh, with Bane. Uh, uh, I, I think, you know, Bane was a good villain, but I, I, it, people just wanted more Joker and it just wasn't going to be possible. Unfortunately. I mean, it's hard to follow that too, but right. with, with Bane, it was like a lot of people were complaining like the mask and all these <laughs> things were an issue. I'm like, I get it, but I honestly didn't see it that much of a problem. I thought it was pretty interesting. I thought Tom Hardy put a good spin on it, but as we can tell, like with him and playing Venom, I see him as Venom. I see him as that's a fit role. Chris right. Evans, it just took me uh, this amount of time to be able to fit him as Captain America. I see him as, um, you know, back uh, Human Torch days. That's just when I first introduced him. Right. But Tony Stark being Robert Downey Jr., these guys are fit for the fucking role. They make you believe it. And honestly, when I saw him, you know, trying to – like even that actor that played Harvey Dent, I he fit okay. But, like, Heath on Ledger – On Gotham? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, um, Heath Ledger fit Joker. Heath Ledger is Joker. Then uh, they had uh, Andrew Lee – or not Andrew Lee. It was Jared Leto that played him. And it right. was like, what is happening? Did we just cartoon him up? Like, you just couldn't look past Heath Ledger. And then Tom Hardy found his spot as Venom. Bane, not a good choice now looking back on it. He did an okay job, but it just didn't fit. You can't think of Wolverine and think anybody else besides Hugh Jackman. Uh, right. I, I think that's going to be a big problem. Uh, so – uh, to address a few of those things, I did feel bad for Jared Leto because there's just, I mean, no way you can't follow Heath Ledger. Anything Jared Leto did was going to pale in comparison to what Heath Ledger had done with the Joker, uh, which is why I, I think it was a smart move on their part to take Jared Leto's Joker and just make him as different from Heath Ledger as possible. Because if they had tried to emulate it, it, it would have come up sorely wanting. Um, but uh, I, I now that the Marvel Universe has uh, acquired the rights to make X-Men movies back, Fantastic Four movies, uh, they're, they're ultimately probably going to recast uh, Wolverine. I, I wonder who, uh, ho hopefully they'll get a very young, uh, deserving, but uh, not, I, I, I don't want a name. I don't want, uh, like, don't, don't give me some Hollywood name. I want some unknown in the same way that Hugh Jackman got that chance, you know. Uh, where he was an unknown in America until he played Wolverine and just uh, hit the stratosphere. He just got you know so much credibility from playing the role. Do you think they would be able to pull another Wolverine off with a different actor if they just included the suit? I feel like if they added the suit uh, in, like the original suit into the mix, it would make it be a lot more believable if he wore that a lot of the time just because it's going to be hard. I mean, even in the X-Men first class, all those like prequel X-Men movies that came out, they CGI Wolverine in there. Like they right. made him look a lot younger just to keep the story kind of going too. I definitely think Sabretooth needs to get a spinoff. Are you kidding me? I, I think that having a Wolverine in a suit, uh, in a uh, kind of comic book suit would fit perfectly in the MCU. Uh, it's so bright, so colorful. It it would fit it in perfectly in the X Men universe. I don't think it would have worked too well. I think that, I know there was that deleted scene from uh, X Men Origins that showed uh, the Wolverine suit in a suitcase that they had made it for him when he. Or was that X Men? Uh, I think that maybe the, the Wolverine, the one where he's in Japan. I, I I think I've got my Wolverine movies mixed up, but uh, he never actually wore it. Uh, I think in the MCU, a, a Wolverine in full costume would go over perfectly. You know, it's been nine years, and the one scene that still upsets me is that X-Men, um, the newest one, the very first one that came out, the prequel one. And uh, first class? It was Darwin when that woman stuck that thing inside of his mouth, and she's like, adapt to this. Mm. And next thing you know, he's like, body's trying to turn metal, is trying to like block it out, and he just yeah. dies. That pissed me off more than anything in the entire world. Nah, I don't know why I'm still upset about it. I'm holding a grudge right now. No, nah, no, nah. that I, I agree with you. That was a painful death. He uh, it looked incredibly painful. He was such a just a nice character, um, uh, and uh, played so well. And you thought, you know, this is this is going to be one of those 
guys that are going to make it. And he didn't even make it halfway through the film. I he got 20 minutes of them and he made you connect yeah. that much in 20 minutes. Yeah, he was good. He was good. That was, that was a, that was a, uh, well-played loss in the movie. Cause you definitely, if you weren't on, uh, the side of the, uh, new X-Men class, you, you definitely were now, yeah. you know? I definitely think um, that was a good introduction into Nightcrawler, too, for a lot of people. Like, I always look at, like, The Beast were some of my favorites, and then also Nightcrawler. You know, I saw very, very little of him. And to see him brought back, you know, at a younger – and also Quicksilver, man. That character, oh. perfect. I mean, those perfect. scenes were amazing where he runs and saves everybody out of the White House. That relies on the soundtrack right there, man. You know, sweet oh, yeah. dreams are made of the – like that. Oh, that, yeah, and, and then uh... – what was it? in the in the first class movie? I think it was Time in a Bottle. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he they 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 did right by Quicksilver in the X Men movies. They did they did wrong by uh, Quicksilver in the Avengers: Age of Ultron. Yeah, Quicks uh, Quicksilver and a Scarlet Witch. Like, see, that's I saw that, and then I saw X Men. I'm like, that's that guy Quicksilver. It was okay to go with Age of Ultron, but they just killed him right off, and it was like you didn't have anything else to say about it. I was like, right. there's no way you can just end it like that. I, I would have. I mean, I, I definitely would have kept him because he was he was a legal anomaly at the time where he could be both in the X Men movies and in the MCU at the same time, because they uh, Fox had the rights to all the mutant characters and uh, Marvel uh, the studios had the rights to pretty much everything else, uh, barring uh, Spider Man. I, I think at the time they didn't have like Ghost Rider, Punisher, uh, uh, Hulk. I mean, they don't have the rights. To, they, I'm not sure if they still do. I mean, Universal may still have the rights to make a solo Hulk movie, which is why it hasn't been a Hulk movie in a while. He just keeps appearing in different... He keeps having his story progress in different movies. But Quicksilver in Age of Ultron was such a waste. And he had such a good actor to play him, too. The guy who played uh, uh, Kick-Ass, I think he was. Uh, and, and oddly enough, the guy who played Quicksilver in the X-Men movie was was his friend in uh, Kick-Ass. They were both in Kick-Ass together. Well, the guy that played Quicksilver in X-Men and was the guy that played Kick-Ass? I don't think so. No, he, was, uh, he wasn't Kick-Ass. He was one of his friends. He had two friends. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, they, I mean, they were both good actors, but just the uh, Marvel wasted their Quicksilver, I think. God, who was the character that played – what superhero was Nicolas Cage? He was uh, Ghost Rider. Yes, that was a good. That was a good. Yeah. Good fit. Nicholas Cage was great for that. I think yeah, they I guess should... he, he, he's probably as, as crazy as Ghost Rider is. Yeah, right? uh, yeah that's uh, that's for sure. Nicholas Cage, man. Yeah. I feel like they should bring him back in a villain routine and give him something like on the lines of maybe Punisher or somebody. Yeah, yeah. He, he he's good. He he would definitely be good. He would fit in well into the MCU. Yeah, he would fit in well. What are your um like what you do with your Instagram as well, which I kind of want to give you a shout out to your page if you want to plug it here too. Oh, um, plug okay. Yeah, so if you yeah. want to tell everybody the name of your Instagram, uh, it's uh, uh Cosmic Comic History. It was Cosmic Historian or something like that originally, but it was so close to a a great account called uh, Com Com uh, Comic History or something. But anyway, Cosmic Comic History. Yeah, I've been trying to do it for about two years now. Um, it you know it has its ebb and flows as it's but it's a it's a hobby of mine. I like to share uh, information. About yeah, it's, it's teaching history to people like that. With like, because you don't understand Instagram is a giant like uh, type thing too. Like, I mean, everybody just wants to see a picture and double tap it. But when you have right, not right. when you have knowledge on the picture, so they're reading it like, well, I did not know that about the Marvel universe. Like, you're teaching comic history or maybe movie details or movie history or something that somebody can get interested in and read about, which I think is super special because I mean, a lot of people just want to see you know Robert Downey Jr. on screen. You don't really want to know any of the history behind. It. I appreciate it. You know, I can't tell you, and it's funny that you mentioned that. Most people don't want to read it versus just clicking on a pretty picture. I can't tell you how many people have told me, you, you write too much. You write too much. But I, I like, I, as you said, I, I want people to know uh, the history behind that, uh, whether, whether it's, it's something happening in the movies or the comic books or something in between. Um, yeah, I love it. I, uh, I'm, I'm glad you appreciate it. I'm glad a lot of people appreciate it. Uh, I actually had a chance earlier this year to uh, be a part of a, a convention here in Brooklyn uh, called PowCon, and I was able to, to hold a lecture on uh, uh, comic books in the classroom, and uh, I was pretty proud of that. And I think and that was a direct result of 
the Instagram account. So I'm hoping that, uh, and as, as is this, and I'm hoping that, uh, uh, you know, just people, uh, I, I don't care if people remember my name, my face or anything like that, but uh, if you're at a party one time and someone mentions a Marvel Cinematic Universe and you're able to pull out a fact and uh, entertain people with it and get them interested, I'll take it. Exactly. I think that's important too. I mean, how often do you, are you sitting teaching one of your classrooms or something? You just want to pull out a magazine and be like, guys, let me tell you a little something about a guy named Captain America. Right. Right. And you know what? I actually, uh, so as are most of, uh, as is most of the world, uh, I'm doing the remote learning now where I'm teaching my students from home and we uh, got to world war two. And I thought this is a great uh, chance. And I, we did a lesson on Captain America as propaganda. Uh, and uh, I still try and I, I think I have a so I, I try and incorporate uh, novels graphic novels into the classroom as much as I can uh, there's a great value in that when I was a kid we had to sneak comic books into the classroom and now I have an assistant principal that tells me what graphic novels do I want and he'll order them for my classroom so it, it really has come a long way and that is uh, I, I think that a lot of it is due to the success of the movies but a lot of it is also just changing mentalities of people uh, that people are not dismissing comics anymore as a 10 cent plague. They're seeing that there is um, value, literary in value. Right. It. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, there are college classes that are being taught on it. Uh, I know uh, Michael Uslan was like the first guy. He's a, he, he went on to become a producer of a lot of movies, including Batman Swamp Thing, but he was one of the first college professors to teach uh, that comic books had value. So, you know, we, we try and incorporate, I don't know if you can see this. Yeah. At all. Uh, you know, we I try and bring his, um, Max Brooks's uh, Harlem Hellfighters is, is a great one. Uh, there, there's so many graphic novels that belong in the classroom for students to learn from. Even if you're not learning from the content, you're learning how to express yourself through the creation of comic books. So either you're consuming the comic book by reading it or you're, uh, learning the skills to create it you know that that white space in between each panel representing a change in time and place being able to uh create a panel that would speak as much as two paragraphs written would uh, it's a difficult task it's a difficult thing uh my, my older brother was talking to me yesterday because he had tried to start a comic strip uh, a couple of years ago he's a great artist and uh he, one of the things he said, he struggled with the writing. He struggled with um, getting that flow of one, two, three, one panel, two panels, three panels, and then starting and uh, climaxing and finishing the story all within those three panels. It's a difficult skill. And I think uh, if children pick up on that, they, they could learn how to express themselves better, write better. Sure. So, Sure as hell a lot more interesting listening about like George Washington or something. Unless you're teaching me Abraham Lincoln, he's a vampire hunter. I'd rather listen more about comic books. I was, I, I was so dis I, I was ready to love that movie. I just couldn't. And, really? And, and, yeah. I, I just, uh, I, I've, you know, in, in all fairness though, I've, I watched it once when it came out. So I haven't revisited and I do, I do own it and I probably should give it another shot, but uh, Yeah. Yeah. I saw that movie in the theater with my grandfather. And I think the only part I really enjoy about that movie is hearing my grandpa go, fuck yeah. Like in the front <laughs> row when he had the ax in between his feet and he kicked it up and flipped it around. Mm. Yeah. That was the funniest thing. I was, cause I was like, I don't want to sit next to my grandpa. So I was like, I'm going to sit in the back. Uh, I sat in the back and you just see my grandpa up front, just go fuck yeah. Like yeah. hands up in the air. I'm like, dude, that is priceless. Priceless. And they, they they had the mockbusters that came out after that Abraham Lincoln versus zombies and all these other movies oh, yeah. trying to capitalize on it. Just like a Sam Elliott where it's the guy who killed Bigfoot and also Hitler. It's a movie that's out. It's, yes. Yes. I, I haven't seen too that. many things into one movie. Oh, it, it was it good. No, I didn't. I never saw it. The, the title you're watching Sam, it because you love sam elliott but then you're like he killing hitler and bigfoot i'm like this man's not even taking a break not getting the <laughs> right. juice not getting some electrolytes back what did, what did bigfoot do to him uh, exactly what, what is he trying to kill him just he just wants to wants to live his life being blurry in the woods hate, haters gonna hate man haters gonna <laughs> hate well t thomas i really appreciate you coming out and doing the podcast man i want to give you here a minute at the end to be able to promote your instagram again and also um if there's anything you want to leave anybody on that might be interested in comic books might be interested in wanting to look up these things 
Uh, sure. Well, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, again, my name is Tom Torme, and my Instagram is at Cosmic Comic History, and you can find me on Instagram. I think I'm on Facebook as well as Cosmic Comics, uh, or but I mostly stay at Instagram. Uh, no, just keep keep enjoying comics, keep the industry alive. It's it's going through a tough time right now. Uh, it needs your support, uh, and uh, you know this is this is a difficult time we're all going through. Um, so uh, just like any industry, it's, it, it needs your help as well. So uh, buy comics, you know, support your local comic shop, support uh, your, the comic industry, and thank you for your time, Rob. It was a great, great chance. Thank you for having me on. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Out of the Blank Podcast, and stay tuned for our next episode.